Welcome to the Living Unconventionally podcast. I am your host, Chris Piak. Every week, I feature a new unconventionalist who has ditched her desk in order to chase her passions around the world. Every Monday, we talk about their epic travel adventures. We also talk about how they make their travels happen from a financial standpoint. Every once in a while, I will coach an aspiring unconventionalist. Together, we will figure out her biggest dreams, why these dreams are so important to her, and what will be the first steps towards her goals. If you aspire to be an expatriate or a digital nomad who travels around the world and can make a living anywhere, join our community of like-minded, travel-loving, adventure-seeking people. Join the Living Unconventionally community at livinguncommentionally.com slash Facebook. Today, we talk about your dream. You dream about ditching your 9 to 5 job and travel all over the world, see the wonders of this beautiful planet and earn a living location independently. And my guest today has exactly this kind of lifestyle. His workplace travels all over the globe. He works in the most remote, remote corners of the world. I welcome to the show Anton Bogras. Hi, Chris. Okay, thank you for the for the introduction. Yeah, <laughs> please go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, Anton, maybe uh, you heard me uh, smirking a little bit when I said that your workplace is traveling all over the world. Because usually when we think about location-independent working, we uh, consider that we travel all around the world, but uh, our employer, uh, our clients, they are usually in one place. But in your case, it's literally your workplace that's traveling, right? It's absolutely true because I work on board seismic vessels worldwide. And uh, yes, technically speaking, the my work desk, uh, the, the computers, and they're pretty much the same, regardless whether you're working in Africa or Asia Pacific or somewhere in Canada. That's just the same place. Yeah. But yeah. So, so what what are you doing? You you travel with a ship across the ocean. But uh, you are not, as might one uh, would suspect right now, is uh, you are not a, a tourist guide. Uh, you are not working on a cruise ship. Uh, your place is much more unique. Yes, I, I can I can shed some light on this. So, make, doing seismic services basically it's much less traveling, unfortunately, as one might expect. But uh, it's still a lot. So basically, if there is a an area to survey, what we do is like as it's. What's, first, what's the purpose of, of your job? What, the what is sound the... waves that we generate with the source, they emit it from the source and then uh, reflected, reflect, refracted, etc. And then we record it. So the purpose of those uh, seismic recordings is to get the image of the subsurface and uh, so that our clients, uh, which are predominantly energy industry companies, so they can... Uh, build the maps and assess their license blocks to extract um, as predominantly petroleum resources, oil and gas. So you're searching for oil. Other sources, yeah. And uh, you have an academic background, uh, which I take from your answer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It is geophysics. Uh, uh, if we call this field correctly, this is geophysics, but the environment uh, I'm currently working in is, is more... Industry. It's pretty much like a little factory uh, where we generate seismic data, mm -hmm. I would say. Yeah. I mean, this is a very, very unusual uh, job. Usually people don't uh, grow up and think, oh, I will be prospecting for oil. Um, how, did you, how did you get into this line of work? It's an interesting one. I had one of the guys I've been studying together with. His sister had this job at my This is the, the competitor's company. And I basically knew about such an opportunity from the day one at the uni. And I always sort of kept it as a backup option. 
And uh, this backup option, well, I'm I'm six years into this, so this this is how this is my what my lifestyle is at the moment. Mm -hmm. And how how has this changed you? I mean, to, to live for six years and to basically uh, how uh, how long are these trips? Uh, how long are you usually go, uh, gone? Um, how do you get there? And then maybe later we talk a little bit about how this has uh, changed you. So. Uh, yeah. How do I have to imagine how you work and which rhythm you work and so on? So the way it works is the following. So you work, um, it depends. Um, it's usually five or six weeks uh, of working. And then if it's five weeks on, then it's five weeks off. So you get approximately a slightly less than half a year of, of vacation which is one of the really nice, the best parts of this job, really. On board, you work for 12 hours a day. There is every single day, there is no weekends, no holidays, no nothing. So it means that you work 84 hours per week for a month and a half or something like that. So this is pretty demanding and it's a very peculiar setting, very international with good people from all over the world. And this something this is something that really changed me. Basically, breaking those stereotypes I think I had about certain about certain countries, certain people from those countries. And uh, this is great when you see uh, when you see the real representatives for some nations. It's it's really great because they can you can learn from them. You can see, you know, you can get something. Mm -hmm. Can you give us one example where uh, the person that you met was a complete mismatch with, with the stereotype that you had Yes, before? I can mention my good friend. I won't mention his name, I, more of a story. This guy is originally from Bangladesh, but he's uh, living in Canada for almost uh, 20 years now. And uh, this guy completely changed my perception of not only Bangladesh, but South, in, South uh, Asia in general. And... Islam as well, because I had some stereotypes and I would say this guy just introduced me to a whole lot of new things about understanding his part of the world and also a little bit about Canada. So that, that's one of the examples. You said he's one of your, your best friends now, or he's a good friend. What is the thing you appreciate the most about him? It's a good question. I would say he's very optimistic and open-minded so i wouldn't go into details it's just a he's a very likable character let's say and uh, it's just fun with him whether you're working or uh we've also been jamming together doing some music so basically regardless of the activity it's always good when he's mm -hmm. around Yeah. Is it, um, is it always the same uh, people that you work with on the ship or is it every time a, a different crew or I wonder if there's a lot of camaraderie in, in, in your work? The crew, is, there is like a core crew that, let's say, doesn't really change. So we do get some changes, uh, but the key positions, they're more or less fixed and people do, do change boats from time to time and especially last few years and the energy industry went through quite a turmoil there's been an oil price decrease that's significantly affected our industry so uh, that meant we had some people that had to leave the company we had some so, so basically normal normal fluctuation like in every organization but it's not that uh, that for every trip there's a new crew no 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 there is a core crew and some crew members uh, they Yeah, you get a certain percentage of the new crew members each trip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how, how do you experience this? I mean, you work uh, very hard uh, for, for five, six weeks on a string and you are on the ship that you can't get off, uh, meaning you see the same faces 24 hours per day. <laughs> how, how is that? Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's, another, that's another good question. The thing is, yeah, you do get tired. People on board understand that it's a very peculiar environment where you have to respect each other. There, uh, generally, we tend to care about each other. It gets harder to do so with the, each uh, 
week, yeah, because like <laughs> it, it's, it's, let's say after a month on board, it's it's it, it's much harder to be nice with people than <laughs> when you just started or, or a couple of weeks. So, but on it's still good. It's all right. It's just. Yeah, it's not easy. It's one of the actually one of the hardest aspects of the job is that just understand, acknowledging the fact that you're not going to leave that place. Sometimes we have port calls and you may spend, you know, a few hours in some city. That's nice if there's such an opportunity. But some for some trips, you just you're just there in the sea around the survey area. You don't see any any land for basically the whole duration of it. Yeah, that was what I was thinking about. Um, yeah, so when, when, I, when, when the support call, it's a bit easier, yeah. I would say, because usually there would be, you would change project and that would mean you would change some people that are only for certain projects. So you see places, so it's not bad. It depends, but again, for port calls, are, that's hard work too. Mm -hmm. So... What were some of the places where you have been, where you have worked? Some of the places, Myanmar, Malaysia, Angola, Ghana, Brazil, Canada, the UK, Norway, mm -hmm. Australia, quite a few places. So, so basically all five continents. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you know, there was one thing that I was thinking about uh, before we started the interview, that uh, all these great places, you have been working there. But what I imagine when you when it, what it really comes down to is that in the morning, okay, you are in Canada, you are in Myanmar, you are in Ghana. But when you go up in the morning with your coffee uh, to the deck of the ship, what you see is water, no matter where you are. Is that correct? It doesn't change much. It's true. So you start to see the details or let's say the, the hues that... Uh, the, It's not quite exactly the same, but uh, uh, it might be a bit <laughs> sort of discouraging thing to say. But the, the thing is, uh, your your typical uh, blue collar worker actually, th they see way more people and way more things during their typical office day than you see on board. So the thing is, yeah, you see endless, endless water some sky yeah it, it can be beautiful it's more beautiful most of the time but the thing is when you see that's the only option you can see and uh that's that's the only thing you see it's you you may lose a bit of appreciation of what you see so it's not much of a change in the landscape so yeah how do you get uh, on the on the ship does it um meet you at the harbor or How does this work? Ah, yeah, okay. That, that's the way it works. You just get the flights. So, so we get crew crew members from all over the world. And let's say there is a specific crew change location. And the way it works, we just all fly to that crew change location, meet there, and then we just get to the vessel. That I, It can be done in different ways. So if vessel is in the harbor, you can you can just walk in could be a helicopter for example it could be a, a support vessel that so you get on a smaller vessel you get to the prospect area and then there would be a small boat transfer from the support vessel to the main serving yeah how do you like a uh, helicopter flight so i flew a helicopter once uh, as a journalist back then and it was uh, really terrifying because it was like a lift with an open door who goes up like <laughs> you know a <laughs> uh, helicopter fly that's that's fine That's that's good. I remember the most spectacular helicopter flight was uh, in East Timor, actually. So that was really, really impressive. What happened? Because basically the you we, we flew the whole island. And it's not a large island, you know, <laughs> from, from south to north. And you just see all those mountains and uh, it's just really beautiful landscape this is the most memorable one i would say mm -hmm. it's east timor but otherwise it's uh, the only thing you can see is just a strip of shore again sea <laughs> lots of sea so that's it so so it's better if you fly over some landmass so you can you know see something Mm -hmm. Good. It's good fun. Depends. It's it's the quickest way for the crew change, unless you're in the harbor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the quickest 
if the vessel is at the is at the prospect location. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you you work on on the boat, then on the ship. Sorry, you have five weeks off, and then you, as I understand, you usually you meet uh, your family not necessarily back home in Moscow, but wherever it's most convenient to meet up. Is that correct? I typically meet them in Moscow because sometimes what we do we arrange a holiday immediately after. So let's say instead of go flying home to Moscow, I would fly to the holiday destination, and then we meet there. But well, that's rather an exception, really, because most of the time I would fly home first and then we we go somewhere else if maybe immediately or, mm -hmm. you know, I give myself a few days to recover in Moscow. Yeah. How is it for your family, you know, to have you gone uh, always for five or six uh, weeks and then to return? That's pretty hard. That's pretty hard and it's not easy and it's basically an open question that is impossible to solve by having this kind of job. So this is something you need to keep in mind that uh, this is more or less main sacrifice you're, you're making. So your family, so on one hand, probably net hours you can sp spend with your family uh, annually is um, it's more than your typical office worker, but you don't have this compatibility as in the office. Maybe it could be an hour or two for your regular office working day but the thing is you you see you see your family every day or almost every day if you travel if you do some business traveling yeah it's still not a large proportion of days when you're somewhere far away mm -hmm. so your family does and friends and close people they, they just don't see you for for half a year so it's fine when you're i think For those who are single, who don't have family commitments and uh, things like that, it's a perfect job for them. They can travel, they can do whatever they want. But if you've got a family, it's pretty hard. You have a, a little son. I, I must imagine that for you, it must be like, like watching a Dia show, you know, click and next picture, click and he's five months, uh, five weeks older. And in this age, children, they change so much, right? Yes, it's absolutely true. So basically all the parenting skills you acquire during your days off, you think, okay, now I know his habits, what to do, how to, you know, how to proceed in a certain situation. Then you go back to the boat, to the vessel. Over there, you, it's totally, it's like flying to a different planet, more or less. You speak different language, it's... It's totally different place, and you behave a bit differently from home. Yeah. So then you go back, and it's true, as you said. It's just almost like a different person. He doesn't. He does well. In my case, he always remembered who I am, so that's fine. That's great. But uh, yeah, the thing is, all these habits, or what, how he reacts on certain things. Yeah, that that's something I had to I had to learn. Pretty much from the scratch, more or less from the scratch. Every every after every trip. Yeah, uh, I see this. I'm, I mean, I work from home office, and uh, I see uh, Tim, uh, our little one, um, every day. But even here, I can see the changes so fast. You know, there's certain things you think of him as a baby, and you talk with him in a certain way, and you offer him something, and suddenly he goes and says, "Nein, danke, Papa." You know, and you're like, "Oh, wow." <laughs> He's now a, a real person. You can have a real conversation with him. And this happens uh, just overnight, you know. That's uh, that's really dramatic. And I can imagine when you don't see him for five weeks, that it, that's even stronger. But... Um, yeah, it's hard. Yeah. Do you have Skype on the on the ship that you can have a conversation via video with your children? And We're not allowed to use Skype on board. So technically you can do it, but we're just discouraged from doing this because of the bandwidth we're sharing so uh, there are some bandwidth that we're using for other purposes and skype would drain a lot so we're not using it but we have phones so you can call you can mm -hmm. call from a from a satellite phone and it's not a problem mm -hmm. so you must really hope that uh, Elon musk uh, creates this worldwide uh, satellite internet that he wants to offer Yeah, hopefully. But the thing is that the satellite internet is more or less uh, it more or less exists. As far as I'm aware, it's just it's expensive. That's the problem. It's expensive. So it's not the same 
kind of. So we do have some. We do have some internet connection over there. It's just not as good as your modern day broadband you 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 have at home. Yeah, this is a, a wide wide field, and you um, you work in it already for for six years. Uh, one thing that we didn't talk about yet is: is it worth it from a financial standpoint? Because as I understand, you 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 benefit from from uh, certain regulations that are not usual for 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 um, people who work in their home country. Yeah, money wise, it's uh, it's pretty good deal. So depending on where you live, depending of kind of on the the type of contract you get, for some countries, yeah, you you just don't pay the the taxes just because you don't spend enough days. In a country, and according to those laws, to, to their laws, you're not a tax resident. So the UK would be a prominent example. France and uh, many, many countries actually. But some countries like Canada, Australia, or the US, you would you would pay taxes regardless. Yeah, yeah especially Americans have a very bad deal there. Yeah, yeah, Americans. It's true. They pay quite a lot. Yeah. Norwegians. They Yeah, yeah, because they it will be taxed no matter where they where they live. I lived for some time in London, and uh, I had a very good friend who uh, moved to Dubai for the simple reason that he didn't want to pay taxes. I always need to smile uh, about that because he moved to Dubai where basically um, what you have is hotels, you have sand, and camels. You know that's Dubai from where I live. People who lived in Dubai they disagree with that, but my perception was always that's the deal of Dubai. Camel sand and hotels, you know. And uh, I lived in London, and um, at that time I also legally didn't pay to uh, have to pay any taxes because um, they have this deal when you are a foreigner, you move to the UK. I don't know if it's still in, in law, but it was 10, 15 years ago. When you are a foreigner, you move to the UK. In the first seven years that you live there, you don't have to pay any taxes on your income as long as you don't generate your income in the UK. And I didn't generate my income in the UK. I generate my income mostly in Germany at the time and other countries. So I could live in London while he was shoveling sand back home in Dubai. And uh, I had the same deal as him, basically. So mm. It's an interesting one. The, the tax regulation, I also lived in London. And I must say that the tax regulation there is uh, very complicated. And it, de it really depends on your case. It's also about the fact that if you're bringing this money into the UK, and there's quite a few factors to consider. So yeah, that's really what kind of on your circumstances. Yeah, yeah, there's quite a few. Yeah, <laughs> Texas variations on, on how things work out for 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 your case. So yeah. Mm -hmm. It's true. So, but even even if you do pay those taxes, uh, you still you still okay. I would say with this job. Mm -hmm. So, what would be your advice from your experience over the years? Besides professional qualification, obviously, you know, for what kind of person would you recommend your kind of job, and for which kind of person would you absolutely recommend not to take your kind of job? I would recommend it for someone who doesn't want to live in a big city. So for people who want to be location independent. So they let's say they want to have some home in you know countryside and uh, have decent um, income job. That's that's a good one because they don't have to live in the big city. Yeah, they can live wherever they want. Another thing is for those who I think doing this job means the best way is to use the traveling opportunities we get because with the help of our employer, you can also arrange flights nearby or let's say you can do extend your stay in the region where you work, when you, where we work. So this is another, another thing that is great. You save a lot on those flights, especially if it's like different, different continents and, I would say these are the two key key factors or, or let's say two factors. If this is important to someone, yeah, this job will satisfy their needs. I would definitely not recommend this kind of job for those who are really ambitious. The thing is, it's not much of a personal and professional development on board. You can become a party chief or basically go somewhere offshore 
or oh, onshore, sorry, go to the office. But again, yeah, that's a bit of a different career path. This is something you can do. What do you, the, the, the answer is like, well, you can do. There are. Is the reason for this that the different jobs on the ship, they are so different that you can't really transfer from one job to the other? You can transfer, but it depends which department. So let's say there are like adjacent parts of the process yes some stages are adjacent to each other in this whole business process and you can definitely transfer if it's not too far so it depends on the part there's few departments on board and some of the transfers would be unthinkable but other changes there happen we have people who who worked in two departments or even three in some cases so it is possible and it's possible to get some office positions as well But mm -hmm. it's not easy. It also depends. Like in my case, I'm a geophysicist, so there's plenty of geophysics in the office. So I can. it's easier for me to get a job from that perspective. Yeah. For, for, for example, for mechanics, there would be less office options. They would, you would have certain mechanics specialists or supervisors or it's a very limited number of positions. Mm -hmm. Are there um, any professions that are really in high demand in your industry? In high demand, all the typical maritime uh, professions are in demand, which is which is natural. To run a ship, you need a crew, yeah. So they're always in demand. I would say having a good bosun who can drive the small boat well. This is quite a high demand. And another thing, I think, other people again in our industry, the things turned out that. A lot, a lot of talented and very skilled workers had to leave the companies. And it's not just my company, it's um, the whole industry. I would say there's pretty much no shortage. It's, it's the problem is on the other end. It's too many people. Yeah, because you can, you can hire basically all over the world. You're not limited to hire people from a certain country. Yes, it's true. It's true. So on, other, on one hand, you need some uh, experienced and skilled workers, so you... But yes, your pool is quite, it's, it's expanded, yeah, by the fact that, okay, it's pretty much globally. Mm -hmm. so, so people could be located anywhere, more or less, as long as there's like a reasonable way to the airport. Mm -hmm. Anton, uh, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. It was very, very interesting. Thank you, for Chris. You, uh, for you personally, what is one place that you still dream of going to? With ship or without? <laughs> The one that I haven't visited, right? Mm. That's a good one. It's Japan. It's Japan. Mm -hmm. What you dream about uh, doing in Japan? What would spike your interest the most? All sorts of things. I, I think it's like I'm pretty much a, every aspect of life there is so, somewhat different to the rest of the planet. So, well, more or less everything. But I would definitely try to do traveling out there you know hiking and uh, seeing kyoto all the temples all these some of the remote mountain villages i think there's like endless number of things to do in japan yeah i believe so anton thank you thank you so much for for joining us in the living unconventionally podcast my name is chris piak uh, i'm your host Listen in next Monday again when we interview a new unconventionalist who chases their dream around the globe, literally. And if you haven't done so, then please subscribe to this podcast. If you want, join our Facebook community on livingunconventionally.com forward slash Facebook. And we hear each other again next week. Bye-bye.